Good morning. Today is Saturday, April 11th, and uh, I thought today as we uh, moved into our update um, that I would begin what will likely be a brief series over a couple of podcasts, maybe a few podcasts, regarding the sequence of end times events. Uh, I know that prophecy in general nowadays is a topic that is uh, uh, generally not touched by a lot of um, a lot of Bible teachers, and I don't claim to be the final word on any of this. There's, there are some great Bible teachers who uh, speak to this subject as the primary focus of their ministries, and so I would recommend them to you. Um, but, um, but the average Christian and the average Bible teacher, uh, the average pastor of a church, a lot of times doesn't want to touch this subject. And uh, in one sense, it's understandable, because when it comes to the subject of prophecy, it can be intimidating. There's a lot of things that the Bible says about prophecy, and because we don't understand how things will necessarily play out in every detail, uh, it becomes sort of a challenge to want to spend time on it, just imagining that you could be wrong about some of the perspectives that you currently hold as things unfold. You may have to change your view on things or change uh, your understanding of things, and that's a fair point. But I would suggest that because the Bible spends so much time talking about this subject, literally about a third of the Bible is, uh, is, uh, is directly related to this subject of prophecy, it behooves us as believers, not just as pastors and teachers, but I think the average Christian, the typical believer and follower of Jesus, should devote some time to understanding this. And my hope is that as we go through some of these things um, uh, uh, in a very basic way, um, that it will begin to sort of take away the fear of looking at the subject. It's important on the one hand that we become students of this area of the Word like we would become students of anything that the Word talks about. We should be students of Scripture. Um, uh, and so this, this topic is something that is worth spending time on. My hope is that the fear of this subject will kind of diminish as we spend a little time talking about it. Um, the other end of the spectrum is, is that it's also important to be a little careful about being dogmatic on every single point uh, within prophecy as we see things unfold and as we stand, uh, as we try to understand them in relation to Scripture. Uh, there are some things that are very, very clear. Jesus will come back a second time. The idea of the rapture is a biblical concept and it will happen. The timing of these events is something that is subject to some debate. And so, uh, and, and some very good believers, uh, very strong Bible-believing uh, Christians have different perspectives on some of these points along the way. And so I would always appeal to Augustine's view that in, in the essentials, we should have absolute unity. Uh, in, uh, in, in the non-essentials, we should have liberty, some room to move and, and debate and discuss. Uh, but in all things, we should express charity or love. And so um, I have perspectives on some of these things, as do uh, most people who study the subject. Mine typically are in line with most of the common thinking on the subject, and so I'm not often some left-field thing. I'm not a sensationalist in, 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 in the sense of, of trying to drum up, um, you know, uh, kind of um, un, unverifiable kinds of things. I will offer possibilities and suggestions, um, but they're taking them for what they are. You know, they're my perspective under the current circumstances as, we, as I try to understand them through the lens of God's eternal truth, the scripture. And so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and start um, just going through some of the basic ideas that revolve around the sequence of end times events. And my hope again is that this will take off some of the edge of wanting to look at these things just to help you gain a certain understanding of how the Bible seems to indicate these things at least from one perspective, may ultimately unfold. Um, and so, um, so with that said, I'm going to, uh, again, keep it kind of basic in some respects. I, I'll, I'll, I'll go further on certain points as, uh, as, uh, uh, as might be the case, but, but I'm going to start with some very basic ideas. I mentioned the rapture, for example, a second ago. And so let me introduce uh, to those who are unfamiliar with the idea of the rapture, uh, what it is and how it fits into prophecy. Uh, the rapture of the church is different than the second coming of Christ. When we talk about the second coming at the end of, of, of the human age, if you will, this period of time where human government uh, rules the world and that kind of a thing, I, I, I don't want to sound cryptic or something, I'm just saying that you know when the current order of things comes to an end and Jesus establishes his kingdom in the second coming, ultimately followed by things like judgment and the things that we tend to be familiar with when we think about the second coming, that is one event. And that is a premier event, uh, a hugely important event that is part of the overall unfolding of God's plan for mankind. But it is different than the rapture. 
In the second coming, we understand that Jesus literally comes back to the earth and establishes his kingdom. The Bible tells us it's called the millennial kingdom. It is a thousand year reign, something that we will talk about as we make our way through this subject of prophecy. But for now, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the second coming. Jesus comes back to earth, sets foot on the earth, and rules and reigns from Jerusalem with a rod of iron. In other words, not allowing sin to continue to be practiced, but dealing with it uh, immediately as it takes place. And the world will get to see what it looks like to have a world that is directly governed by God. Um, but the rapture is a separate issue. The rapture describes an event where Jesus doesn't return to the earth, but rather he leaves his throne in heaven to come and get his bride, the church. Uh, there are a couple of primary places where we read about this in the New Testament. One of those is in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul describes what that change and transformation takes when the rapture happens. Uh, and just quickly, uh, uh, I, I should probably say too, I'm going to try and keep these podcasts at around 15 minutes, which is why we're not going to cover the whole thing today. But this will just be the first of whatever series of them that it'll be as we cover it. So um, the, again, the, one of the places we see what the rapture looks like is in 1 Corinthians 15, where those uh, who are alive on the earth will be snatched up to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we ever be with him. And he'll, he doesn't come back to earth and collect us. Rather, he meets us uh, in the air, or I should say we meet him uh, as he steps out of his, his, of his throne to come get us, but he meets us in the air. Uh, there is uh, kind of a neat, um, oh gosh, this is, okay, well, I'm going to go here just because it's a great, great analogy. I'm going to quickly just talk about an example in the Old Testament here that I can never resist to bring up. And since I've talked about the rapture, a picture of that, uh, in retrospect, is visible in this example in the Old Testament. And interestingly, it's all the way back in the book of Genesis. In uh, Genesis chapter 22, uh, Abraham is called upon by God to take his son Isaac, his firstborn, and whom God acknowledges as his son, his only son, Isaac. Now, Abraham had another son, incidentally named Ishmael, but Isaac was the son of promise that God had made to Abraham that through his offspring, the nations of the earth would be blessed. And Isaac was that son through whom uh, ultimately that, that, that lineage would go, that would lead to Messiah ultimately. Uh, and so um, uh, that said, uh, Abraham is called to bring Isaac up to Mount Moriah. Now you can read about this again in Genesis 22 and also in 24. In Genesis chapter 23, Abraham's wife passes away. And uh, that is sort of a, a spot in between these two chapters. Um, and so uh, 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 he's called to bring Isaac up to Mount Moriah and offer him. And so as Abraham, as the passage goes, arises early the next morning, he makes the three-day journey to Mount Moriah with his son and his caravan with the various elements for the offering, the, uh, the wood and all those kinds of things. And so as they make their way uh, to the, uh, the mount, the, the foot of the mount, um, Abraham says to his servants to wait here, the, the lad and I are going to go and worship, and I will return to you. And so he go, they go up the hill, and midway or somewhere along the way as they're making their way up, Isaac, who is not a young boy, he's not like, you know, five years old or something, he's probably in his 20s or early 30s at this point, but he's carrying the, the wood for the offering up the hill, up Mount Moriah. And he's walking with his father Abraham, and he, he asks his father, hey, we have the wood for the offering, but where's the offering itself? Isaac has no idea what's ultimately coming. Where's the offering? And Abraham uh, very famously says, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide for himself an offering. And so, uh, or some have translated that, the Lord will preside, provide himself an offering. Um, but as they make their way up the hill, Abraham, who's a very old man at this point, he was around 100 when Isaac was born. And so um, he's a very, very elderly man at this point. And so as they get up to the top of the hill, Abraham takes his son Isaac and binds him on this altar that they have built. And he's about to offer his son Isaac, raises the knife. And before he brings the knife down, the angel of the Lord shows up and says, Abraham, stop. Uh, it is clear now that, I, that you will not withhold even your most, your most uh, precious possession from me. Uh, and, and, and here instead, really, you know, uh, here's a ram caught in the thickets. Offer this instead. And Abraham offers it instead. And, uh, and it says that Abraham uh, goes down the hill and meets with his, uh, his servants and they go back. Now, um, historically speaking, I'm sure Isaac went with him, 
but it is significant and at least interesting, if not significant, I would say it's significant, but it's at least interesting that uh, there's no mention of Isaac going back down the hill with Abraham. It just says Abraham went down. Um, and so um, they go back and, and, and they go home and, and, uh, and uh, some time passes. Uh, chapter 23 passes. Well, in chapter 24, uh, we find that Abraham, the father, is sending out a servant to go find a bride for his son, Isaac. And uh, the servant in, in chapter 24 is unnamed. Uh, he's, not, he's named earlier in chapter 15, but his name is not mentioned here in chapter 24. Um, so Abraham sends this servant out. And if you're familiar with the story, if not, you should read it. But the servant goes, and he goes in search of a bride for his, uh, for his master's son. And so he comes up upon uh, Abraham's uh, um, um, relative, Laban. And, and so um, I, uh, he, he gets off the, he, as he's, arise, he's uh, drawing near, he um, has got all his camels with him. His camels, which by the way, are loaded down with uh, gold and, and, and precious things that are going to be gifts that he's going to uh, ultimately bestow upon the bride-to-be. And so he comes to this home and he comes uh, across, uh, as he rides into town, he, he says, Lord, I, I, I pray that you'd give me success on this journey for my master's sake. Uh, let it be that uh, the, the woman who comes and offers to water me and my camels, uh, um, you know, this will be the one. And so as he arrives, uh, here comes this woman. Uh, and her name is Rebecca, and she uh, she comes up and she sees this servant show up and says, "Oh, you know, here, let me water you and your camels." And so the servant's thinking, "Yes, the, the Lord's given me success. Where do you live? Who do you who are you with?" And so she brings him home, and the servant there meets her family and begins to tell the story about how he's on a journey to find a, a bride for his master's son, and invites her to come with. And so uh, he begins to shower her and her family with all kinds of gifts from Abraham. And, uh, and, and the family is kind of on board, but they're kind of holding her back a little bit until finally the servant says, uh, will you come with? And she says she will. Now remember, she's never seen Isaac before, but she comes based on essentially faith, trusting what this servant has been telling and basically looking at the gifts that have verified some of his story. Uh, and so she takes stock of some of that and says, yes, I'll go with. And so she comes with the servant. And as they start getting closer and closer to Abraham's home, Isaac sees them coming and he runs off to meet her and he takes her in as wife. Now, that's an interesting story. But what does it have to do with what we're talking about prophetically? Well, I mentioned before about the rapture being this uh, event where Jesus doesn't come to the earth, but rather he comes and we meet him in the air. Uh, the entire gospel story is in type portrayed in that account from Genesis 22 and 24. Uh, it is uh, the father uh, is, is, uh, offers his own son. Uh, and, and interestingly, again, I'm, I'm trying to be brief about this. But Abraham, when God calls him, he, from that moment in his own mind, he knows, we know this in the book of Hebrews that makes reference to this story, that in Abraham's mind, Isaac's as good as dead. He's dead. God has asked for him. I'm not going to withhold him. As, as for all practical intents and purposes, my son is dead. And so that three-day journey takes them to Mount Moriah, where ultimately uh, they go up the hill and such. And so that three days between the time when in Abraham's mind uh, he is uh, dead to the time they get to Mount Moriah, where God restores his son to him. Remember, he doesn't kill him. Of course, God's intention was never that Abraham would actually kill Isaac, for any who have trouble with that story. But the idea was to demonstrate for Abraham's sake and for all of us who read later what faithfulness looks like in all of this. But in that third day, when they get to the mountain and Abraham goes up the hill with Isaac, uh, <clears throat> God says, God will provide himself an offering. Well, that's very telling, isn't it? Because God himself later on would offer his own son. He would provide the offering up on the top of the mountain. Moriah, which by the way, is in modern times known as Calvary, or the hill where Jesus was crucified. Some thousands of years, thousands of years later, another father offers his own son in the very roughly, or maybe even exactly the very same place. But in that third day, the son is restored, or if you will, resurrected in type, back to the Father. And so uh, uh, there's that. Sometime later, the Father sends out a servant to go find a bride for his son. 
Well, the servant in chapter 24 is not named, but in chapter 15, he is named, and his name is Eliezer. And it might be shocking to you to know that Eliezer means helper. Now, why is that important? Well, when you read in John's gospel, when Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit, he refers to him as the helper, the one who's going to come alongside, the one who is going to ultimately draw the bride to Christ. And the Holy Spirit is about that business right now. Uh, the, the, the Father has, in fact, sent out a helper to go and collect a bride for his son. And that is what the work of the Holy Spirit is in the world right now, to draw pe people to Jesus. Uh, and so one day, when the Father says time is right, and a whole other thing can be done on, on, on the, the picture of the rapture and in, in, in the Jewish marriage ceremony and these things, that's another whole thing. I'm not going to go into that now because I want to get back onto this. But that's huge, and it's, 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 it's really, really cool. Well, when the time comes for the Father to send the Son to go collect his bride, the bride goes, uh, the bridegroom, Jesus, goes out and meets the bride midway and brings her home as his bride, just like in the rapture. And so, uh, again, that's a lot to throw out there all of a sudden, but it's one of the great typologies that we see in Scripture. It's one of the great metaphors or allegories that we see. Uh, is it a metaphor or an allegory? I forget which, whatever the case, you know what I'm saying. Um, it is one of the great types in Scripture where God paints the gospel uh, for us, even in the Old Testament, even, even through the event of the rapture where Jesus comes to collect his bride. And so the rapture speaks of this idea to kind of come back around to where we were. I'm going to just talk about the rapture for just a moment. Uh, again, I said I'd keep it to around 15 minutes. It's probably going to be more like 20 or 25, so forgive me for that. But here in 1 Thessalonians, I'll invite you to open your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, where we talk uh, about what the rapture is from Paul's own writing. Notice what Paul says here in chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Now, it's important to recognize that the church in Thessalonica, uh, who Paul writes a lot about the end times to between his first, uh, in his first two letters, or in letters 1 and 2. He only wrote those two letters. Um, uh, but he, um, uh, he speaks about the end times quite a bit. And here, uh, the reason he does that is because these believers, whom he only spent about three weeks with, we find out in, Acts, uh, in, in the book of Acts that he spent only about three weeks there. And uh, uh, in that time, he talked about all kinds of things that helped them grow in their faith. And not missing from that was this idea of the second coming and the rapture. And so Paul is reminding them of what he said to them because they're troubled by the persecutions and the circumstances that are going on around them. They're afraid possibly that the rapture has happened or that the second coming was about to appear and they somehow have missed something. And they're troubled by this. Um, I, I mention uh, the circumstances in part because uh, the subject of the rapture is a subject of a lot of debate uh, in, in the Christian church, which is one of the reasons why oftentimes people don't touch the subject. But let me just uh, simply say that one of the, uh, uh, the, the points of contention is that the idea of a rapture prior to uh, or at the place that I personally believe it happens, and that many believers do, there's varying views on it, uh, it's called a pre-tribulational rapture, the idea that the rapture happens prior uh, to any part of the tribulation period or that seven-year period leading up to the return of Christ. Um, I think it comes before that. And one of the reasons why that point is contended against is because it's generally held by many that the idea of the pre-tribulational rapture did not come about until around the 1800s under, under the teaching of somebody named John Darby. Uh, not somebody, he's well known in this discussion, but John Darby is, uh, is generally viewed as the one who kind of gave us our modern day view of a pre-tribulational rapture and, and a lot about dispensationalism in general. Those are big terms that, you know, uh, at some point we'll maybe spend more time on. Um, but I would suggest, uh, just to keep moving here, that the pre-tribulational rapture idea doesn't start with Darby. I would suggest that it starts in Paul's writings to the Thessalonians. Uh, and even in the, the writings to the Corinthians. I think that the anticipation on the part of believers in the first century, at least as far as Paul was concerned, ought to be in the knowledge that Jesus could come and snatch us away at any moment and do the very thing that Paul writes about here in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13. Let me read that here uh, from the Word. Uh, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep or those who have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. This is where the word rapture comes from. The word there is harpazogamathea, which is a Greek term, which in the Latin Vulgate uh, was ultimately uh, uh, was, was written as rapture or rapturo. And this is where we get our idea, the idea of being snatched away or caught up. Uh, those of us who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay. Now, um, that is the idea of the rapture where those who have passed away first, and remember Paul's answering their concerns. Uh, they're worried about those who have died and what happens to them if Jesus returns and they didn't last, they, didn't, they weren't alive when he came, what happens? Well, Paul here first says that when Jesus comes, he's going to come with those who have died, those believers that they're concerned about. They'll come with him. Jude talks about this when the Lord comes with uh, ten thousands of his saints. Uh, uh, and, and so you can read about that in the, in the one chapter book of Jude. Um, but he says they're going to come with. As a matter of fact, not only that, but when it, even prior to all that, there's going to be another event where we are literally caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And those whom you're concerned about who have died already, who, have, who didn't uh, who are not still alive to see this happen, they will, have, they will actually, in terms of sequence, rise first, and we will be caught up to meet them. Now, that will all be instantaneous, but in, in the, for the sake of understanding some kind of order, the idea is that they will ultimately go first, and we will meet them and join them in the air as we meet the Lord in the air. And so there is a generation on the earth uh, in that time, and I believe it's in our lifetime, when this event will take place, where there are going to be millions and prayerfully and hopefully maybe even billions. That would be good news. If, uh, if billions of people who are alive and, and believe in Jesus have put their trust in him uh, will not in fact die a natural death, but will be snatched away prior to that uh, and go to be with the Lord. And after that event, either immediately or sometime after, will become uh, the tribulation period, uh, which will culminate in the second coming of Christ. And so um, that is what the rapture is, okay? Um, now, let me address a question that often comes up when we talk about these things and describe it. And I think I'll end there and, and continue our, uh, our discussion on, on the sequence of events and prophecy next time. But let me respond, let me, uh, let me address a question that oftentimes comes up. Why should any believers uh, believe in such a thing uh, which ultimately is just an escape from hardships in that. I mean, after all, uh, haven't Christians throughout the ages had to deal with hardships and persecutions and things like this? What makes, what makes us think that we should be a generation that would escape these things? Why, is, why would we hold that view when, when other generations didn't have that? Uh, why is that fair? And, and those kinds of questions. Um, well, let me start by saying, uh, uh, to answer that question, um, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm trying to be very conscious not to set up a straw man uh, argument here, but, but let me just say the entire question about the rapture and escaping the judgment of God that is coming upon the earth is different than the idea of escaping hardship. The events that take place on the earth after the rapture, uh, during the tribulation period, and especially during the great tribulation, the second half of that final seven year period, are going to be very, very difficult, incredibly difficult. But the difference between the hardships during that period of time and the hardships that, ex that exist now is that the hardships that exist then are a direct result of God judging the earth for its rebellion and the people of earth for their rebellion against him, for their refusal to come and be saved, for their uh, wanting to reject God and keep him at arm's distance. As a matter of fact, you'll see throughout that period uh, as the scripture records it, that people know what's going on. They're being judged, but they're cursing God and wanting to die rather than repenting and turning to him. Uh, to give you an indication of where their hearts are by and large during that time. I believe many will get saved during that time. Uh, but by and large, the characteristic of the earth uh, that stands out is that they, are, they remain even in the face of judgment and rebellion against him. That period of time is God's judgment on the earth. Why should we think that believers who are alive during the time leading up to that should be raptured away? Simple, because we're not appointed to wrath. Who took our wrath for us? Why aren't we appointed to wrath? Why is it that our rebellion and our sin isn't going to be judged during that time? Because it was already judged 
at the cross. As a matter of fact, Paul would say later on in, the, in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, he would remind them, the Thessalonian believers, and therefore us as well, that we are not appointed to wrath. No Christian should ever expect to escape hardship or persecution. As a matter of fact, Paul would tell Timothy that any who seek to live in, in godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And not only do we not expect to avoid it, we should expect to see it and receive it. Um, so we should never feel as though uh, we get a free pass when it comes to difficulty and hardship. That's been the uh, uh, thing that has followed believers throughout the entire history of those who have followed God. However, God's judgment on the earth is different than hardship in the world. God's judgment on the world is a direct consequence of their sin and of their rebellion. The direct consequences of our sin and rebellion as believers has been paid for by Jesus himself. And I would commend you to watch yesterday morning's podcast on this, or even our Good Friday service uh, from last night, uh, as we talked about these things in great detail. And so I would, I, would, I would counsel you to go ahead and watch those to get a fuller sense of how that all works and, and the passages that bear this out in Scripture. Um, so it's important to remember that when we talk about the rapture, we should look for it with hopefulness, with a sense that, yes, it could be today, and it's certainly for believers, because Jesus paid our penalty. He took he took the death that we deserved. He took the punishment that we deserved. Therefore, there is no more wrath for us to endure because Jesus took it in full measure. And so we now have been forgiven, not of any works of our own, but simply because of the love and grace of God. The only thing we did was respond to it and receive it. And that is something that is all that's left for any human being to do to be free of that judgment, is to put their faith and trust in the one who took it for them. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And one of the great benefits of believing the gospel is the fact that we will stand as friends of God, as sons and daughters of God in his kingdom for simply having received that gift that he gave us. And so the rapture is the means or the vehicle by which we escape the judgment that God brings on the earth because of what Jesus did, remember. But the, the rapture is that means by which we go to meet the one who paid our debt for us and forever be with him. And so, um, so that, that hopefully brings a little bit more clarity to what the rapture is. Uh, now, where it fits in terms of the rest of what we'll talk about in terms of uh, the sequence of prophecy and how it unfolds uh, is, again, a matter of some debate. I believe it happens prior to most of what we'll talk about in the coming podcast, with the exception, possibly, of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which we'll talk about next time. I do suspect it may happen prior to those events, too, but it, it may not. But, uh, but again, that's one of those areas where believers uh, differ and, and have healthy discussions and, uh, and, and all of that. And I think that's valuable to have uh, as well. I guess maybe that's a thought to end on. As we talk about these things, um, don't be afraid of having discussions and even debates about these things. These things have been instructive and helpful for believers for as long as the church has been around. And so we shouldn't avoid those things. We should always do so in a spirit of grace and love, right? Let all of your speech be seasoned with grace. That should be true in these discussions, whether it's the rapture, whether it's things, uh, anything to do with eschatology, whether it has to do with other topics that are often hot button issues, things like uh, Calvinism and Arminianism, free will and, and, uh, and God's sovereignty. Those discussions are beautiful and rich and meaningful. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, another point that, that is often um, debated among believers. Are they for today or not? You know, uh, I'll save my answer to that for some other time when we talk about it. Those of you who go to our church know where I am on those things. Those of you who don't, you just have to wait. But anyway, the reason we talk about these things and should learn to talk about them openly is because they ultimately enrich our faith. They help us to know more about the God whom we love and serve. They cause us to think deeply about things where we might have uh, you know, not been prone to do so before. And thinking deeply about the things of God is a healthy thing. Uh, and it also teaches us to learn how to interact on these things in a way that is loving and respectful and not necessarily creating more heat than light. So let me encourage you in that. And uh, and then tomorrow, or not tomorrow, tomorrow's Sunday, we don't do a Sunday podcast. Uh, I would invite you to watch our church service if you're so inclined, or join your service where, where you attend or where you're watching nowadays during the COVID-19 thing. But be part of a fellowship tomorrow as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And then on Monday, we'll go ahead and, and continue this topic of prophecy and the various sequence of events uh, that are involved in it. So thanks for watching. Let me pray uh, and as we end. Father, we thank you that, uh, Father, you've given us so much in the Word that helps us understand 
uh, about your nature and your character, but also as we've begun to explore today, even your purposes and plans in the days to come. And Father, um, uh, certainly mathematically, every day that goes by, we find ourselves one day closer. But as we'll see as we go through our study, as we look at the world around us and what's going on, we recognize that we are definitely drawing very, very near to the day when Jesus will come and collect his bride and ultimately uh, we'll see uh, the world coming to, uh, a, the events of, uh, of world history coming to a crescendo as Jesus establishes his kingdom. So we thank you and we, pray, and we praise you and we thank you for this time we could spend and pray that it would be fruitful. Help us to, to walk as, as your children in love and grace and help us to be students of your word. We love you and praise you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.